dragon. Is this where the damn drumming and the music kicks in? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, hello and welcome to On the Pipe Podcast. Once again, today is Tuesday, October the 17th, 2023, years after zero. And I am your host, as always, Tyler Shepardson. And uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for being here. A lot, kind of a lot to talk about, a little bit to talk about, not a lot to talk about. Not a lot of racing went on this past weekend, but there's a lot of racing and a lot of championships to be wrapped up this weekend. We are right in the heart of of the late season everywhere you look every race event that you go to there's championships to be wrapped up all the way from the pro class down to the c class we've seen some of our pro championships been wrapped up already especially in relation to gncc xc3 toby cleveland that thing's already wrapped up uh wxc rachel archer she already made the repeat happen um so now that leaves two big ones on the table xc1 and XC2. Now, both of these do have some pretty big big gaps, but just like racing goes, just like how we know that racing goes, anything can happen as we head up into the hills, the fields, I should say, of Ironman Raceway in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Check the weather. Knock on wood. Looks like we're going to have some good weather at the Ironman GNCC, which is always a good sign because we've been there in the 35 degrees and pouring rain. We've been there in the monsoons. We've been there in complete Dust Bowl conditions. Now, I can't speak to the conditions. It might be Dust Bowl conditions for all I know. If someone is local to Indiana or knows what it looks like up there, then uh, go ahead and let us know what it looks like because I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, That being said, temperatures look good, look to be in the 60s, looks to be no rain on the radar, which means it looks like we're good to go. Looks like it's going to be a good time. So, um, give me one second here. I'm just trying to get everything situated. For those that are listening to this afterwards, I'll let you guys know that we are live on Instagram right now. So, I see that there's a lot of a lot of questions coming in on Instagram already. I'm um, just trying to get this thing rolling, get everybody seeing it. But if you are listening to this in the way that you normally listen to OTP, whether it's Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you're listening at, uh, we are live on Instagram. So hopefully you're going to be taking some questions here and then uh, engaging with the fans. So that was the whole whole big thing on here. I want to know what you guys want to hear about. And this is a kind of a way to give it a live reaction. So I saw some comments in here already. I can't really touch my phone or it's going to fall. So now I have it pulled up on my computer here. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll talk about them. We'll talk about them. And uh, so yeah, any questions you may have, anything you want to know about the show, anything you want to say about racing, any of that, uh, just go ahead and type those questions in the comments. But looking at the XC1, it is a 23-point gap between Craig DeLong and Stu Baylor. We talked to Stu on the show last week about everything that happened at the Buckwheat 100. An unfortunate turn of events, especially going in with just one round left to go. Uh, But now the gap is 23 points, so that means Craig DeLong needs 13th place to win outright, 14th place to tie. And if it does go to a tie, Stu would get the uh, the nod based off of the criteria. First, they look at the most wins. Then they go to the most second places, and then so on and so forth. So if Stu was to win and Craig was to get 14th, they would tie in points, but that would also mean that they are tied with three wins on the year. And if you look at second place, Stu has more second place finishes, so that is the way that that would go. And then the XC2 battle is down to 18 points between Liam Draper and Angus Reardon. So... When you look at that, that means if Angus was to win, Liam would have to get ninth place or better in that XC2 class. But, like we mentioned, anything can happen, anything can go wrong, anything will go right. You never know. There's still three hours left of racing. Looks like we got our first question on here, so we're going to get to that one. 
A.D. Byram, Devin Byram. For those that don't know, Devin Byram is uh, one of the founders of OTP, one of the original hosts of OTP. He says, who will be the next in-studio guest? Maybe it's you, Devin. I don't know. Uh, we talked to Strang about coming down and doing it. Strang's local. Trevor Bar- Bollinger is a local. Trevor Barrett's a local, too. Uh, I want to get the young Aussies in here. We got Angus Reardon, Mason Simmons, Lyndon Snodgrass. They're all right down the road. Hopefully we can uh, get one of them in studio, especially as the season starts to wear down. Can we play, rumor has it, Mason Ottersburg getting in here hot and heavy, already stirring up the drama as soon as we get into here. He says, can we play, rumor has it, Heard Tealy Energy is taking on a Cowie deal. Now this is a bit, it's a bit of a weird situation because two weeks ago when Stu Baylor was on the show, that was one of the things that he talked about. He said, when are you going to do the silly season podcast when are you going to talk about some of the silly season stuff and he said that he was interested to know what was going around and what was being heard of I thought it was ironic because he is one of the people directly involved in that Tealy Energy team that that you're talking about and so um yeah according to sources that I've heard from it does sound like there might be a change of brand on that Tealy Energy racing team uh, I, I say that. I'm not sure that it will be the Tealy Energy racing team. Um, but that team and its involvement, I I have I have also heard those rumors. I cannot confirm nor deny what is true and what is not. But I have also heard the same rumors that they might be on green bikes next year. I've also heard some rumors about people going to that team and some other team changes going on. Uh, Liam Draper, current XC2 points leader says that's some of the best coverage of the races behind you there. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Even got the message from him saying that before. Uh, so, no, I, I really appreciate it. And, I mean, you got – especially the racers. Um, and by racers, I mean specifically like XC1 and then top XC2. I'd be interested to know like how often you guys see me out there because it, it is kind of hard to be able to make it all over the track. Uh, all these YouTube videos that I put up, that is that is all my footage. That is me riding around, getting from place to place on the track. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of having people all around the track to be able to provide me footage. That is me waiting basically for like top three and XC2 to come by and then throwing my camera in a backpack and hauling ass to the next spot so i try to get as many spots as i can a lot of it depends on the layout of the track so this one the the buckwheat 100 i didn't know anything going into it i didn't get there till 11 o'clock in the morning on sunday and uh the way that it was kind of laid out it was it was cool i didn't know where the spots were but i was able to find a bunch of good spots and uh able to get it was like 30 minutes of footage and we just put them up on youtube raw no commentary, no cool edits, no uh, rap music with with flashing lights and cuts. Just raw racing, exactly how I saw it, exactly how the race progressed from start to finish. So um, it, it's cool to get some of the feedback, especially someone like Liam Draper. I know you messaged me earlier in the week and, and said something about the video as well. So uh, stuff like that is, is part of what keeps me doing it and gives me the motivation to to go out and do it. So uh, I like that everybody's liking the the raw stuff. Um, Devin Byram says a lot better than Racer TV broadcast. The Racer TV broadcast, I mean, it is what it is, especially now that we're getting in fall and the leaves are off the trees. And uh, with the introduction of the drone that they put out there, yeah, it's kind of hard to see that far away with the drone. But you can kind of see some of the lines, and there's been some some good stuff to come out of that drone footage. But even the short clips in the woods um, – it's hard to knock it because they are the only race series that are that are actively trying to broadcast woods racing. Is there room for improvement? Yeah, probably, but there's room for improvement in everything. And like I said, they're the only ones uh, doing it and heading up that program. So uh, thankful that we have that Racer TV footage and that Racer TV feed to kind of keep you up to date with what's going on. But, yeah. Uh, Devin says, I joined late. Did you talk about the Mideast over the weekend? Nope. So I actually jumped on here and just – Kind of started talking, not really knowing a direction of where to go. I think one of the big things we want is uh, people asking questions and engaging. So thank you for asking the questions. Mideast this past weekend was pretty sick. Uh, a couple of events or a couple notable things from the Mideast race this past weekend is, um, one, 
a few races ago, we talked about Ethan Harwell, who is one of the KTM semi drivers, Scott Harwell's son, one of his sons, Gavin Harwell, uh, also races now in the same class as, as Ethan, at least for the next couple races. But uh, so we, we talked about Ethan racing the, the morning race, so the youth race. He overalled the youth race, and then he moved up to the AM race to try to win that race and then ended up having a crash and, and pulled out of that race in the previous time and then also raced the pro race. Well, he did it again this past weekend. He went out there. He overalled the youth race. Uh-oh. And then in the – um, I guess I need to stop hitting the the table. So there's your inside look at how messy the OTP studio is right now. So Ethan Harwell goes out there. He wins the youth race. And then at Mideast, we have an 11 o'clock amateur bike race. It's like C class and then the old guy A classes. And uh, also the like the women's AB class when, when they're all racing as well. So Ethan Harwell wins the youth race in the morning, steps up, races the AM bike race. Now TJ Brown is a local kid. He just turned 14 this year. And he has gone 13 and 0 on the season. He won every single amateur bike race that we had at Mid East this year, which is an impressive feat. It's hard to do, especially like I said, those old guys in the morning, they're fast. And calling them old guys, I'm sorry, I'm not too far off of it. So when I get there, hopefully I don't think of myself as old. You know, I'm just picking with you. It's a it's a fun bunch. I mean, Patrick Tobin, Mac Reed, which shout out to to Mac Reed. He uh, went down at the start, 11 seconds into the race. He sent me the GoPro footage. 11 seconds into the race, he falls, uh, dislocates his shoulder. So, speedy recovery. Hope hope everything's all good there. But, yeah, I mean, David James, Patrick Tobin, Ron Awad, um, John Chambers. I shouldn't have started la- naming them because I'm going to forget about people on the spot. But they're fast. And so, for TJ Brown to go out there this year and win 13 straight races in a row and go on to try to have the perfect season, he wrapped up the overall title at the last race and I asked him, hey, are you going to try to stay down and, and make it 14, 15 and 0, or are you going to move up? And he said, no, I'm going to try to go for the perfect season. Fast forward to this past weekend. That's exactly what he did. He was racing that AM bike race out of the four stroke C lights class. And Ethan Harwell decided he wanted redemption. So he overalls the youth race in the morning, which is an hour, goes straight, literally from the podium, chatting with me on the podium, straight back to the starting line. He overalls the amateur bike race by three minutes which is insane. So now one hour youth race wins the overall two hour amateur bike race wins the overall first person in history to ever do that, to overall the youth race in the morning, the amateur bike race in the uh, afternoon, and then went straight back out for a schoolboy row in the pro race for another two hours of racing. So five hours of racing for Ethan Harwell makes no sense in the world. Um, also, if you follow uh, my personal page, then you probably saw the big tire jump that goes over the tires that were on the ground. That's a pretty big gap. Like it wasn't, it wasn't small. And obviously, you're landing on flat. And I was wondering, like, who's going to be the first one to do this? Like, is a C class rider going to hit it? Someone in an amateur race going to hit it? Are the pros going to hit it? The first person that hit it was Super Minis. It was Caden Johnson and Ethan Harwell on an 85 in the youth race in the morning. So both of them hit it, which was absolutely absurd. Um, There's no way that I would hit it. I would have a sore back for like four months. But, yeah, so two kids on mini bikes hit it in the youth race in the morning, and uh, they were the first two to do it. But then fast forward to the amateur bike race, they were doing it as well. Anyway, long story long, the reason I said that is to set up how dominant TJ Brown has been this year and how good TJ Brown has been at the Mideast Hair Scrambles. And for Ethan Harwell to go straight off of a youth overall and go and take that unbeaten streak from TJ Brown is insane. So it was the 14th round of Mideast Racing and the second overall winner of the AM bike race, which is absolutely absurd when you think about it that way. Um, So yeah, that was cool. And then the pro race was a lot of fun as well. Josh Strang texted me about 9 o'clock in the morning and said, hey, I'm 90% sure I'm not coming, but what's the track looked like? So I sent him an update on Snapchat. I was kind of explaining it to him. And at the time, so yesterday when we got there, it was, or I say yesterday, Saturday, when I got there, it was still raining, like pouring rain at my house. The track is only 30 minutes from my house. We get there. It's still raining. Super, super, super soupy, super muddy, just a mess. Well, by the time Sunday morning came, track looked perfect. By the time Sunday afternoon came, 
it was a little bit dry, a little bit dusty, a lot of dust actually, but perfect weather, perfect temperatures and all that. So Strang ended up coming doing an, uh, about an 11, 1130 uh, tire change and, and bike prep to come out and race for a two o'clock race. But uh, he came out, Bollinger was there, um, and then all the all the locals were there. Tyler Palmer, Mike DeLosa, Zach Davidson, Colton Shields, um, Brody Johnson. Jonathan Johnson was out hunting, giving up on uh, giving up on racing to go hunting, which I can't say that I, I, I blame him that much. But uh, so yeah, Bollinger came out. He led the first couple laps, and then him and Strang were kind of going back and forth, swapping back and forth for the lead. Um, and then Strang ended up making the pass, getting in the lead. Uh, Bollinger's back brakes went out, but he was still able to, to charge and push pretty hard, um, especially for not having no back brakes, which talking to him on the podium, I guess that was one of the, the big things he wanted is to be able to be in that late race battle with Strang just to kind of uh, get back acclimated. He spent most of the year off of the bike this year with injuries. But uh, it, was, it was cool to watch that battle, especially early on. But then Strang would go on to take the overall win. Bollinger would hold on for second. Held off a charging Brody Johnson, who was making up ground there. Um, but, yeah, Bollinger was still able to, to hold him off. Early in the race, early in the race, it was a um, it was a really good battle as well. Um, sorry, my phone keeps falling. I don't have my tripod with me, so I got it makeshift set up on another camera. But, uh, yeah, so earlier in the race, there was a, a big old train and big old battle going on. Tyler Palmer was actually running in the number uh, three spot. And then there was a train of Mike DeLosa right behind him, Brody Johnson right behind him, Colton Shields uh, coming on strong as well. And then uh, Mike DeLosa ended up having some bike issues and was out of the race. And then, uh, like I said, Brody Johnson was able to get in that third place spot. But all around, good racing at the Mid-East Hair Scrambles. So thanks for asking. Um, if those are just joining, go ahead. And if you have any questions, want to know anything, want to talk about anything, throw it in the chat and we'll answer some questions and, and talk about what's going on, um, in the world of off-road racing as we head into the final round of GNCC racing this past weekend. A couple other things to note, Steve Holcomb, beta guy. You guys might remember Steve Holcomb last year. He came over and raced the first couple rounds of GNCC, uh, did a little bit of other racing over here before he went back. But, uh, yeah, Steve Holcomb is a legend in his own right. This past weekend, or last weekend, rather, he wrapped up the Enduro GP title, making him a nine-time world champion, which is absolutely absurd. And he's doing it on a beta, which, no surprise, you know what I mean? Beta motorcycles. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to throw that out there. I meant to put that in the last episode, but we ended up getting a little bit carried away. So, yeah, Steve Holcomb makes it a nine-time championship winning effort world championship winning effort on that beta machine so that was cool to see him across the pond on that beta putting it to work which leads me to a very good point very good time to drop in here that beta motorcycles is the official manufacturer of this very podcast otp they're family owned and operated and they have been since 1905 they manufacture the finest enduro trials and dual sport motorcycles that are known for their premium quality and what else? The rideability. Head over to BetaUSA.com for more information on their available models and find a dealer near you to get yours today. Beta motorcycles are the only dirt bike that I know that come with a warranty. They're also the only dirt bike that I know of that you can order with your parts already on them. You like a certain handlebar? You can have it on there. You want your suspension set up? You can have it sent to you already with your suspension set up. They have their own suspension uh, tuning in-house. So um, it's pretty cool. So BetaUSA.com. Check them out. And then uh, you can find a dealer near you if you want to go look at them and, and see them as well. And then, as always, this episode is brought to you in part by Zach Tussle at Raymond James Financial. Zach is a racer, a financial advisor, and a good friend of the show. He's been on the show. If you hadn't heard that episode, uh, type in your little search bar wherever you're watching at for Zach Tussle's name. You'll be able to hear from him and exactly what it is that he does and how he can help you out. Or you can go to financialadvisorsdenvernc.com. Let him know you listen to OTP. You can get a free consultation, and he can let you know exactly how he can help you. Spoiler alert, he can help your money make a lot of money. So he's always my first recommendation when it comes to financial advising and, and that sort of thing. So financialadvisorsdenvernc.com or look him up on uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Tussle. You can find him on there, and yeah, go back and, and listen to that episode. You can kind of hear about Tussle's racing background and then how he got into financial advising and, and how he's able to help you 
so well. Uh, Rivers Morris, top B rider on the weekend. I think he got eighth place overall. He's also incredibly rude and incredibly inconsiderate, so not worth mentioning there. I'm just messing with the old Magic Creek Morris. Um, I mess with Rivers. Call him Creek because not big enough to be a river, but maybe maybe one day. And then we'll say, and just like that, he done grew into a river. Big Tom. Uh, I don't know if it just keeps sending me the same notification or if you've actually requested to be in the live 18 times. Uh, but I keep seeing it pop up on here. Unfortunately, this is my cell phone that you guys are watching me through. And I have no way to put a microphone or anything on that. This microphone is actually recording the podcast for the week. Um, so that's why I haven't accepted the request. Otherwise, we'd have you on here and, and chat with you and see what was going on. But Big Tom says, are you racing Iron Man? Yes, I am. That is my intention. My intention is to race Iron Man this weekend in the industry class. So that is the uh, that is the plan is to race Iron Man this weekend in the industry class. If it was going to be a monsoon, I absolutely wasn't. Now, which beta motorcycle, which beta steed am I going to be riding? I'm not quite sure yet, but we're going to figure it out some way. We're going to be out there. And we're going to be we're going to be throwing some. Uh, we're going to be throwing some elbows at J-Law. All right? That's right. J-Law is racing. Let J-Law ride. Well, he's going to ride this weekend at Ironman. And he better watch out because he's on a road with Tyler Shepardson this weekend. I'm going to have a big old headlight and a horn right there on my beta. I'm going to be honking at him coming into the first corner. I just want to let you all know right now. Um, Jay Reeves, 884, where do we put questions? That is a question, first of all. And I want to let you know you put your question in the right spot. So you're off to a very good start. Industry class nearly killed me last year. Ugh, it's tough. Yeah, see, that's what I'm also worried about. And there's always some fast dudes in it. Like, we got J-Law in it this year. Caleb Russell races it. Axel Hodges has raced it. Uh, Travis Pastrana has raced it. There, There's legit no telling who is going to show up and be in this industry class. But they all better watch out for this old big-headed loud mouth of the South on that starting line because I'm coming for it. I'm I'm telling you what, I, I'm racing hard for two corners. And then after those two corners, that's about all I got. Then I might ride around, uh, pop some wheelies, talk to the fans, and have a good time. You know what I mean? Beta on the roof rack of the Yoda. What's up, D Steezy? Dylan De La Cruz. If I'm not mistaken, Dylan De La Cruz coming off of a, a local overall victory this weekend. I think I saw on the Instagram. But uh yeah, beta on the roof rack of the Yoda. So that's the thing. I got, I got, I got a hitch for the for the Corolla hybrid, which right now getting fifty two miles per gallon. Shout out, pretty pumped about it. But it's a class one tow hitch, so it can't hold the tongue weight of a motorcycle. I can pull a trailer, but it can't support the tongue weight, so I can't put the the bike on the back. That makes getting my bike long distances like Crawfordsville, Indiana, very difficult. And so. <laughs> I'm just I'm reading some of these stuff coming through as I'm trying to have a have a thought here. But uh anyway, yeah. I'm not able to do that and I don't have a trailer set up yet for it. So I'm trying to find somebody that can bring my bike up or uh the beta boys might have one for me. Actually, that reminds me. I need to write that down cuz I need to figure that out tonight cuz they're probably leaving tomorrow or Thursday. So I got to figure out what bike I'm racing. I might be on a 252 stroke that'll be at the track waiting on me. Or I might have to put the 390, break it down, put it in the trunk of the Toyota. I don't know. Put it on the roof or find somebody that's traveling up by me and uh, throw it in the back of their rig and see what we got. <clears throat> what else we got here? Scrolling through. Paul Alley just raced XC1. You got this. I don't think they would let me. I would try, but it says by promoter discretion. I think if they saw my name pop up, probably be a big no on that one. You cut and wait like it's an MMA fight. Nope. I ride a beta that's got that premium quali premium quality and rideability. The heavier I get, the better the suspension works, the more traction I got. So it all works out. Um, I did see somebody, somebody, a buddy tagged me um, and started to get a little bit off topic here, but MMA fights. A couple years ago when Tyron Woodley and Jorge Masvidal, or no, was it? Kamaru Usman? No. I forget who. Oh, it was Jorge Masvidal stepped in on short notice to fight um, Kamaru Usman for the belt. 
And they said that he couldn't lose 21 pounds in a week and a half time or two weeks time. And I said, that's super easy. And someone said, no, it's not. And I said, trust me, it's super easy. And uh, so I did it. I lost 26 pounds in three days for no other reason other than to prove how easy it was. So 26 pounds in three days was the weight cut that I did. Anyway, fast forward to this weekend. Uh, two of the main events fell out, but one of them was the lightweight title. So Alexander Volkanovsky is stepping in to fight Islam Makachev on a week and a half notice. He said he was 180 when he got the call. He's got to make 155. So what's that, 25 pounds? And everyone's saying that he can't lose 25 pounds in a week and a half. My buddy tried to challenge me and to do it again. want to let you know. I'm not doing it again. It's saved on my Instagram. If you want to see how to lose 26 pounds in three days, you can go look at it then. I'm not doing it again. I got places to be this weekend. So there's my rant about that. And that leads us into Joey Plyler racing Ironman. Thanks, Devin Byram. That was the one that made me laugh a minute ago while I was trying to talk. Ride it all the way up there. You won't. So 10-4 media Carson Atima. He told me to ride it up there. I wish I could. But I, I think that would be a very long, very cold, very uncomfortable ride. But them betas, you can put a plate on them, make them street legal, good to go. You know what I mean? J.J. Smith says yo-yo. No, I don't have a yo-yo, just have an expo marker. Uh, MT417, why does NCHSA races always forget, forgot, get forgot about in your race reports? MT, I think it's been addressed on the show before. I'll just I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. A couple years ago on Facebook, one of the guys that runs the North Carolina series cussed me out on Facebook for absolutely no reason. They canceled a race because someone pilled, spilled a two-liter bottle of water. It got too wet, so they canceled the race. When they rescheduled the race, they rescheduled it over top of a big Mideast round. Um, and like I said, you put schedules out at the beginning of the year, you got some overlapping races, it is what it is. But to reschedule a race for rain and then reschedule it over top of a local, and it was like 30 minutes down the road. Kind of a BS move, in my opinion. I didn't even say anything that strongly. I just said, hey, if you guys are going to reschedule over top of locals after the schedule's already been out for months now, have you ever considered putting a race on a Saturday or just waiting for an open weekend? And one of the people that runs the North Carolina page flat out just cussed me out, started saying all this stuff to me in the comments, turned into a big old ordeal, and just completely rude, completely unprofessional. And ever since then, I have not raced a North Carolina race. And they're all around my house. I live in North Carolina, obviously. I've never raced a North Carolina race ever. And I've never covered a North Carolina race ever. And it's all because of that person who is in a position of power at the, at the North Carolina thing. That's how they want to represent themselves. Therefore... I kind of wrote it off for the past six years. So I'm willing to make amends. I don't even know if that person is still involved. I don't know the state of North Carolina racing. But, I mean, to be completely completely honest with you, um, that is what happened. And call me petty, say I hold a grudge, whatever. It is what it is. It was just completely rude, completely uncalled for, and completely unprofessional. Therefore, I, I kind of went like what my mama told me growing up. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And just like that, I wrote off North Carolina from uh, from the show and from my life. But like I said, I'm willing to make amends. Maybe if someone can reach out, uh, we'll chat. But that is why I never talk about North Carolina, which shout out to my good buddy, one of my best friends, Dustin Simpson, Destruction D. He's actually in the hunt with Evan Earl into the, uh, the, the overall championship for North Carolina. So I would love to see my buddy Dustin win that championship. But even with Dustin winning races and being that in that hunt, I've just chose not to – not to give it any airtime because I really didn't want to get into this rant, but now it's out there. So yeah, that's the that's the true reason. Yes, I remember this. This is what I was talking about. Let's go, Jay Reeves. I imagine you were talking about the uh, the MMA weight cut. So yeah, I did it last time. Twenty four pounds, three days, and that was completely like off the couch, like not ready, not overly hydrated, not in a fight camp. Uh, just did it just to prove how easy it is to be done, and I, I say it's easy. It really is like it's hard mentally, but like physically, it's easy to cut weight because that's what you're doing. You're cutting weight. You're not losing weight. It's easy to mess with your glycogen stores and get those cleared out. It's easy to salt load and then load up on a bunch of water and then cut salt out, water load, and then get all that water through your system. 
there's a science cutting weight. I grew up my whole life wrestling. Uh, I was a state champion in North Carolina, um, and and so I spent a lot of time cutting weight. And so that that is how where I learned that, how I learned it. And like wrestling, we're cutting weight, and then you're on the mat 30 minutes to an hour later. Um, amateur MMA fights that I did, you get 12 hours, so you cut the weight, get 12 hours before you weigh in, and then professional MMA, you get 24 hours. So. It's no problem, especially like the the way that these guys have it down to a science now. It, it's even better cutting all that way for MMA is absolutely no problem. Then you get 24 hours to rehydrate, piece of cake. Do it for the listeners. There's fast guys over there that deserve the exposure, says Devin Byram. I assume you're talking about North Carolina races. Like I said, I'm ready to make amends. It's been a six year long grudge. I don't know why that guy cussed me out in Facebook comments. Don't know why. He attacked me for something stupid, but I'm willing to make amends, willing to talk to those guys. And I do want to cover it because there are fast guys over there, um, like Robbie Norwood. He he was racing them things. Evan Earl, Dustin Simpson, um, uh, 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 Garrett Duncan. He raced this past weekend, which when I was talking about Ethan Harwell overalling the morning race at Mideast, he did it over Grayson Lale and Garrett Duncan. Like, they were in the sportsman class, and they got into the overall and adjusted time, but then Ethan ran them back down on adjusted time and beat them. So Garrett Duncan, a North Carolina overall champ, and Ethan Harwell, a 14-year-old redhead kid, beat him after winning the youth overall like 10 minutes before that. So uh, that was pretty crazy. Jay Reeves, what's the latest contract deals you have heard of? Campbell721 also says drop some silly season hints. Um, silly season is a is a whole ordeal. You know what I mean? Well, let's uh I think it was about to throw on just a regular podcast. Let's throw up let's throw up something entertaining at least so you got it on there. Um Silly Season. This is all speculations. I've just I've just heard some stuff. I think one of the most important things to talk about with Silly Season this year is how many people are without a ride. Uh, I think I might have mentioned it before on the show, but one team that has some good riders and has had success, I've heard, is going away. And then another team is going to absorb a couple of those riders, but not all of those riders. So now... There's going to be another team on Pro Row that does not have an XC1 rider. There's going to be another team that only has XC2 riders. And I know that I was going to do Silly Season last week, but you got to go about it in a particular way because of how much secrecy there there is in this. And I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to foil any plans. I don't want to make anybody mad at me. But I mean, there has been some Silly Season rumors. So I've heard that Magna One is taking over Trail Jester's riders. So I don't think Trail Jester's will be a thing anymore, which really stinks because Ross has put so much energy and effort into supporting. Um, I know a lot of it was New England riders, but then it even expanded outside of that. Guys like Mason Simmons, who just came off this podium uh, at the GNCC. And so that was kind of unexpected, but then that also leaves Jordan Ashburn, where does he go? Now, once again, uh, from everything that I'm hearing, and granted, silly season is exactly that, silly season. So none of this is 100% true. None of it is the gospel. I'm not I'm not saying that this is uh, black and white and this is what it is, but from what I'm hearing is that Jordan Ashburn will be going over to the Coastal Gas Gas team or, let's say, a Gas Gas factory team. So that's going to be a, a change that I think is coming and a change that is on the horizon. Um, I've heard that we kind of talked about it earlier. We kind of mentioned it, that there might be another team switching brands, maybe, um, a couple riders going over there as well. So I don't know. I don't know how much, how much detail you guys want to want to hear about some silly season stuff, but there's a lot going on. And as dirt bike mag, which I'm assuming is, is Mark, uh, commented, choose words carefully. That's the thing is that this gets into a whole weird environment as we talk about silly season. So, um once we hear let let's get through let's get through October 31st and then we'll talk about silly season. I wanted to drop it last week, but contracts typically in this world go through October 31st. So starting November 1st, 
Some changes might be announced, but that is also when current contracts are over. Now, keep in mind, any of the silly season stuff, I've said it in the past, any of the news that I get is not coming directly from riders. I would never put riders in that position. Also, once again, just like I've said on the show numerous times before, I'm never going to hear one thing and then come on to OTP and say it. That will never happen. You'll never catch it. Even if someone tells me that the grass is growing green in Indiana, I'm not going to come on here and tell you, I heard the grass is growing green in Indiana. What I do is I take a piece of information that someone volunteers or asks about and then take that and ask some other people, not in a not in a prying way, but kind of hinting around it to see if they offer up the same information. And then if I'm hearing it from two completely different spectrums, there's a good chance that that is probably going to be true. So then kind of kind of use it in another conversation and see if that information is offered up. So basically what I'm saying is that I'm not going to take anybody's word and throw it on the podcast until I do my own investigative research to figure out how true those claims are. So I'm never going to take information from one person and say it on the show. And that goes just like silly season. I'm never going to take one person's thing and put it out here and and say that that's what's going on unless it is directly related to them. But uh, yeah, so anything that I say on the show has been from multiple sources or else it's not getting talked about. But still, like I said, contracts are through October 31st. So while I wanted to do a Silly Season episode last weekend, let's hold off. We'll do that in November. So that way, uh, don't get anybody in hot water, don't get anybody in trouble, or at least less hot water. And like I said, typically I don't go to riders. I definitely don't pry information from riders. I am the media guy, but there's also a lot of stuff that I know that I'm not going to ever say on the show because that's just uh, that's just how it works, you know what I mean? But as the media guy, if there's something that shouldn't be talked about, I'm not going to talk about it. But also as the media guy, if there's news, if there's something going on, we're going to tell you about it because, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what the podcast is here for. So long story long, in November we'll go over some silly season stuff, but there is some juicy stuff out there, and I did drop a couple of bombshells allegedly that I heard might be happening. So – We'll leave it at that. Um, P double O Blake Poochie Plonsky. I just left Louisiana with the five fourteen machines. Uh, P double O twenty seven is in the chat. That is Stu's mechanic for the year. Uh, Blake helps out with that. Uh, the the enduros down in um, Louisiana, the national enduro that goes down there. That's actually where I met Blake at a couple years ago with uh, my whole national enduro. Uh, run that lasted two rounds. <laughs> that was supposed to be the rest of my life. We made it two rounds, you know what I mean? That's close enough. Uh, but, yeah, I met Blake down there, and uh, he's hung around the Shoals, um, Gulf State off-road. He does scoring and everything for some Enduros and some other events down there. So um, he's come up to, to score some of Stu's races at the Shoals and all sorts of stuff. But Blake's a good dude. If you haven't met him yet, stop by those uh, RMA TV MC pits and uh, chat with him. He's a, he's a good dude. Off road to thirty four. More silly season updates. I think I've I think I've exhausted that one. Brandon Ayers says so. If J Law wants to throw down, you can handle your own with the wrestling background for sure, man. I'm like I said, I'm gonna be up there then throwing elbows. You know what I mean? If someone wants to someone wants to get busy, we can get busy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm excited, man. So I heard that he might have been racing it a while ago, and then it kind of got confirmation. Um, at last weekend's race, but then obviously they just announced it today. So that's going to be sick. Like, I don't know. That's like one of the last people you would expect to be on the line at a GNCC. So, uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be banging bars, throwing some elbows in there. Um, but yeah, dirt bike mag, choose those words carefully. I'm trying, trying a little, little hop skipping. It's like the floor is lava when you're a kid. You gotta, you gotta jump on the pillow over to the couch cushion over to the arm of the chair. You know what I mean? Um, but it's just the, the world that we live in. Um, Jay Reeves, all right, got to jump off, bring some apparel. See you Sunday. Thanks, man. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you this weekend at Iron Man, I reckon. I do have some some medium uh, camo crew necks that I got to get rid of. I only have medium. Sorry about it. Um, next week, my phone is going to stay up, but this week it's not. Uh, we're going to drop some some fall apparel. So we got some new OTP stuff coming. Listen, I get it. Anybody that wanted a an OTP shirt that says on the pipe podcast and has a logo on the back, you know what I mean. The shirt that I always wear, the shirt that a bunch of people have already bought in the past six years. Listen, if you wanted that shirt, 
you want an On the Pipe podcast shirt, you've gotten one in the past six years. All right, I know that. I understand that. We're going to phase those ones out. We got a new line of stuff coming in. I got, uh, we're going to be doing a flannel. So we're going to have an OTP flannel. Uh, we're going to do the OG OTP hoodies. It is anybody that has one, ask them. Guaranteed it's their favorite hoodie that they've ever had. It's my favorite hood, hoodie that I've ever had. Mine's sitting right over there. Most comfortable hoodie that you'll ever find in your life. We're going to do some OG uh, OTP hoodies. And then I got a couple other designs for some long sleeve and uh, outerwear stuff that's going to be dropping next week on our shop. So be on the lookout for that. Um, Bradley Chapman is going to take this racing thing somewhere. I think the the 25-plus champion of the world at Mideast this past year, Bradley Chapman won the Open B full gas title. Back when full gas was full gas, he won it on an old-ass CR250. So I think he's really going to take this racing thing somewhere. Zach Lee says, counting on you to get some big names to the airport Mideast in two weeks for that big money. That is the weird thing. So there is... I think it's over a $12,000 purse in the pro class for the next Mideast race that's going on in Hickory, North Carolina, which is crazy because that's a lot of money. I think the the last time I saw it right now is currently at $3,000 to win. First place gets $3,000 at the next Mideast hair scramble, but I think the overall pro purse is even bigger than that. And so um, it's going to be crazy money. But the other thing about it is last year we had Stu Baylor and Caleb Russell come out, obviously amongst others, but the battle came down to Stu Baylor and Caleb Russell as they um, battled and then Stu made the pass on the last lap to take, I think it was $2,000 to win it last year. So this year it's going to be $3,000 on the line just to win, and I think they're paying back all the way through 10th, but a ton of money. So the landowner there, it's a, it's a live airport. So while there's a race going on, planes are going to be laying like it's a live airport but uh the landowner's father passed away and so now he turned it into the wilson memorial in in memoriam of his dad and then that's also why they throw the money at it just to they want it to be the best race of the year the biggest race of the year the most star-studded race of the year so there is over ten thousand dollars on the line there's over three thousand dollars to win and like i said that number can keep going up but the only negative thing about it this year is that it is on a national enduro weekend and the reason that stinks is because Stu Baylor will be there. Grant Baylor will be there. Jonathan Johnson, Brody Johnson, Trevor Bollinger, Ben Kelly. All those guys that are normal locals and factory guys that would typically be at this race, uh, they're not going to be because they're going to be up at the National Enduro. So, I mean, that could that could open the door for all sorts of people to, to come to that one. I mean, that's, that's big money on the line. So, we'll see who shows up and we'll see how that race turns out. But no doubt, it's going to be a good one. Uh, we check down off roader 34. How do you feel about Thad coming back for Ironman so soon after his bad wreck? So first of all, I think he's insane. Um, in the best and most endearing of ways. But what I'm wondering is I saw him post that thing today. It said crash seven time, get up every time. Is he racing Ironman? And did he win a local race this weekend? Those are the two things that I didn't have time to look up, but it looks like he's on a podium and it looks like it's in the middle of the podium from this past weekend. So I don't know if he races this, this past weekend and I don't know if he's racing this coming weekend, but with the injuries that he's had, I mean, he got injured in this race. Maybe there's a race on the TV behind me. I don't know. I'm trying to look. I don't think that's Georgia. I think that's actually, uh, I think that's the Mountaineer. Yeah, that's definitely the Mountaineer. So he didn't get hurt at that race. But in Georgia, I think is either when he, he got hurt or the first race that he sat out when he was hurt. But then when he came out and said that he broke several vertebrae in his back, I, this is just a couple of months ago. We talked about it on the show. We updated about his injury. We threw out the T's and P's for Thad Duvall. And now we see him back on a bike and riding? It's insane. And then if he is going to come race this weekend – I, that's just next level. Like I would have never thought the way that everything went down and, and the injuries that he he sustained this year w was one thing, but then to have that crash and break vertebrae in his back, and now not even it hasn't been three months for sure, um, or if it has, it's been right around that. But yeah, if he comes back and races this weekend, um, that's absolutely insane. And kudos to Thad Duvall because that is that that mental grit and that toughness that you don't find, especially in other sports, but even in this sport, you don't find it in a lot of people. To be able to sustain those injuries and be 
go through everything that he's gone through. If Thad Duvall comes back and races this weekend, it's going to be absurd. So, yeah, uh, he might have posted something saying he was going to race. I just saw the the one post today. So uh, someone let me know if they if he's posted anything since then. But, yeah, I don't know, man. He's they, There's a reason they call him bad Thad Duvall. It's hard to, hard to hold him down. Uh, I saw Stu just jumped on here. He knows what riding with a broken neck is like. But, uh, yeah, you talk about that grit and that willing to push through. I, you can't teach that. You can't buy that. You got it or you don't. So, um, yeah, be interesting to see how that whole thing turns out uh, this weekend. So, uh, Paul Alley says, William Wilson was one bad dude on a bike back in the day. He was gnarly at the Shelby Fairgrounds in the 90s. Uh, I know William Wilson as a person now. Um, didn't know him from, from back in the day. So I wish I could have, could have saw that happen last year at the airport race. That's where I met old, uh, Woodchuck, Jason Gilliland. Uh, he overalled the morning race by like five minutes. And I said, who is this guy? And now he's riding my old motorcycle. My old beta 300 from last year is, uh, the Woodchuck's bike that he's racing on now. Campbell 721 says, definitely exciting time in the sport. Motocross Supergrass. Supercross guys switching over. Triumph coming out with an off-road franchise and XC getting a lot more publicity. Think it'll ever get to the point of MX, SX coverage? I don't know. That's a tough question. So I've also talked about this on the podcast a bunch before. That was my goal for starting this um, whole thing is to bring the coverage to off-road. Uh, I don't know. I'm really bad at giving myself credit, but when you look at the numbers, the sheer numbers that OTP has done – I think that speaks for itself as far as a as a off road standpoint, or how far of a net that we've been able to to spread and and cover. Um, so that was my whole process when I started this thing to shine that brighter light on off road racing to bring that same exposure that motocross and supercross has, but bring it to the woods. I mean, these dudes are gnarly. They're look at the conditions that they're racing in back here. And they're not racing for a 20-minute moto, a 30-minute moto, a 15-lap main. They're racing for three hours, and they're going as fast as they possibly can through the trees. And people like Stu Baylor are falling and breaking their neck in a race and finishing the race. It's absurd. Meanwhile, Supercross guy, and if there's some of you on here, sorry about it, uh, they take five minutes to get up from falling over, tipping over in a corner and get back going. When the, the the video that I point to every time is Josh Toth. I forget what National Enduro it was, but when Josh Toth wrecks going Mach 12, ragdolls goes flying through the dirt. You see a ball of smoke and some boots rolling through the ground, and then just runs back over to his bike, picks it up, spins it around, and takes off, keeps going. These dudes are gnarly, and what they do is impressive, and that is why no matter what direction the show goes, hint, hint, there might be some stuff coming up, might be some announcements coming up soon, this portion of the show will always remain the same, and this portion of the show will always be catered to the off-road world, the woods racing world, because these dudes are gnarly, and they deserve to get their stories told and to be out there. Uh, Stu Baylor, thanks for chiming in. Cherokee 2019. Look at the video of Josh Toth from Cherokee National Enduro in 2019. Go cartwheeling through the ground, cloud of smoke, gets up, runs back over to his bike. It's absurd. Um, and you don't see that. Yes, Supercross is on TV. You don't see stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, that is why I don't mean this in a bad way. And being in this position, everything that I say can get taken in a bad way. So I'm going to put it out there. For those who have listened to the show over the years, you know how big of a fan of Caleb Russell I am. When Caleb Russell went and raced Unadilla, the first race he did, before he committed and made the whole big thing, he went and raced Unadilla where he went out and ran in the top three for the majority of the moto. They had to do an entire segment on the broadcast to let fans at home know who Caleb Russell was. The average Supercross and Motocross fan didn't know who Caleb Russell was. And that is absolutely absurd. You're talking about the guy that has won more GNCC races than anybody in history. The guy that is considered the GOAT by pretty much everybody. The guy that won eight straight GNCC championships. And the average Supercross Motocross guy don't even know who he was, like, to where they had to explain it. Like, who's this guy? Um, so, I don't know. I think a big part of that is the media coverage and the way that, that off-road is portrayed in in comparison to Supercross and Motocross. So, will it ever get to that same level? I don't know. I think until you can find a watchable product that can be televised on TV, probably not. 
Uh, but my goal is to bring as much exposure and coverage to it. Um, this year in OTP alone on uh, our videos, so TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, uh, we've done 800 million video views this year. Not all time, not in the past six years. In 2023, we have done 800,000 video views, uh, which is is pretty quickly approaching 1 billion. Um, I mean, we're, we at one point, we're averaging 40,000 podcast downloads per month. And you see the social media engagement and uh, the interaction stuff that we get. So those are people that may not have been introduced to this sport otherwise. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, bringing eyeballs, bringing attention, and bringing people over to the sport. So that is the goal behind OTP is to grow those numbers, to grow those eyeballs on the sport. And I think in turn that's going to help the sport grow a lot. So I'm trying to do everything that we can to grow the sport of off-road, whether or not it will ever meet that um, that exposure and that money that's in Supercross and Motocross. I don't know. I obviously hope so. Obviously, that's the goal, but I think there's a lot of steps until we get there. Uh, but I'm going to do my damnedest to make sure that that light gets shined in the woods as well. Uh, Justin Tucker, thoughts on J-Law Racing Ironman? Uh, I think it's sweet, but you might want to message J-Law and ask what his thoughts are about having to line up on the line with Tyler Shepardson in the industry class, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, talked about that <laughs> a few times, but um, that's my final thoughts on it. I think it's cool. Can't wait to see it. Uh, Stu Baylor, the 28-time National Enduro Champion, ISDE World Champion, chiming in. Heard that is signing with Triumph for XC2. Uh, you're wrong, buddy. It's going to be Ducati. He's riding Ducati in XC2 next year. No, it's uh, obviously Stu joking around. But, I mean, in this world, you never know. I think once we see a Triumph out at Motocross and Supercross, I think we – We'll possibly see a uh, 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 what's the color? The green color. They have a specific word for their green. I forget the name of it. My buddy Paul at Armor Graphics is screaming at me right now for not knowing this. Shout out Armor Graphics. They were the on the reveal bike for the the Triumph at Supercross, which is pretty sick. Um, Campbell seven twenty one on the Ampro Yamaha. I assume that that was like three rants ago, so I'm not sure who you're talking about being on Ampro Yamaha. Uh, Mac A 115 Baylor is a goat though. He for sure got that dog in him. I agree. That had to have been during the broken neck conversation. Uh, I think I think it's hard to deny that you can love Stu, hate Stu. What you can't do is say that Stu is not headstrong or is not tough. I think uh, I think he's proved that. Not Stu joining in just in time to watch himself in the background. I guess was Stu up on the screen uh, when he joined in. That that would have been a funny time to join in. Uh, you Campbell seven twenty one. You should be super proud of what you built with OTP. Thank you, man. I appreciate you saying that. Um, like I said, it's really hard for me to to give myself credit or kind of toot my own horn. And so uh, when other people recognize it, I think that's really cool. And like I said, I think because that has been recognized in some other aspects is kind of some of the stuff that we have this up to something season, uh, which should be in the final stages of that. I don't mean to lead you guys on. Don't mean to keep you guys lingering. Hopefully uh, we will be announcing some stuff in the, in the very near future. Remember that October 31st uh, date that we talked about earlier. Brandon Ayers said, Heard Stu is signing J-Law for next year. That would be the sign of the century. Could you imagine? Who who else could we pull out? What other old school moto guys could we get out there? Um, to have Zach O, J-Law, Ryan Sipes all on a line together. Who else Who else can we pull? I talked to Plessinger at SMX. Plessinger, Aaron Plessinger at SMX told me that he has at least one GNCC on the schedule for next year. Don't know if that's possible. Don't know if his team's going to allow it. Don't know if he can do that. But what I do know is that he looked me in these two eyes right here, and he said that he was planning on racing in GNCC next year. So there's my source. I gave up my sources on that one. So I hope to see that. Nolan Osteen, who won Mideast this past Sunday. Sorry, Nolan. 
We did talk about that. I actually went in a whole big old rant about that. Uh, and lucky for you, it's going to be in this week's episode of OTP Tuesday that you can download anywhere you get your podcast because this little microphone right here has been recording this whole entire conversation that we've been doing off of this cell phone right here on Instagram Live. With that being said, we're going to have to wrap this thing up. We're getting close to an hour. If you have a question, if you've been on here, throw it in the chat right now because we're going to be signing this thing off in just a minute. But as always, be a friend, tell a friend, let everybody know about the podcast if you like it or you found something useful or you want to make fun of me. Either way, a listen is a listen, a download is a download. Um, check us out on the Pipe Podcast everywhere you can get a podcast. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play Store, YouTube, um, every random podcast app you can think of that I've never heard of. We're on there too. Um, so yeah, we're growing. We got some big stuff in the works. We got some exciting news to announce. And um, in addition to the original Up to Something season, we're also got another Up to Something season that is kind of in line with some of the stuff we talked about today. So, uh, yeah. I thought this would be a cool idea to kind of come on here and, and hear from you guys and be able to engage with you guys. So I hope you guys liked it. Uh, Blake, let me know. I can't sign off because he's still got 13 hours of drive time. Actually, oh, dang it. Coming from Louisiana, you're not going to. I was going to say, you can stop on by here, sit down and chat, and then throw that old beta in that rig and bring it up there with you. But I do got to find someone that can bring my bike up to Ironman for me. Uh, Blake, hey, man, drive safe, 13 hours. I got to get on the road probably Thursday, and it's about 11, 10 hours from me. So, yeah. Stu Baylor, you going live now? Is he? Was Did he say that somewhere? Was he supposed to be going live? I don't know. Anyway. Be a friend, tell a friend. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to OTP. You can find this episode and more. You can listen to the the breakdown, not the breakdown, the breakdown of the uh, of the race last weekend from Stu Baylor's mouth himself. If you had not listened to that episode yet, um, it's on there from from last week as well. Uh, last question here: Dirtbike Max says, "What do you think the difference between an off road fan and a moto fan?" I think the off road fan is more core dirt bike guy i think they're the ones that are spending the money on parts i think they're the ones that are drinking beer in the woods and uh i think the the moto fans are casuals no i'm just kidding i didn't mean that um i don't know i wouldn't say there's much of a difference as there is a similarity i would say that the the biggest thing is like the past couple years in the ama results or in the ama uh world the amount of off-road race participants has superseded the amount of moto race participants. So when you go to your local moto race, a lot of times, excuse me, between all the classes, there's 40 or 50 guys racing. This past weekend at the Mid-East Hair Scramble, we had over 400 riders in one race, just the amateur race. So then when you add Saturday racers and Sunday racers combined, there's probably 900 riders at a local event. And then you look at our other local series, they're pulling four, five, 600 riders. And then, um, I, I think that's the biggest thing is that I think the that the off road world relates more with the working man. I think it's uh I don't know, it's I think it's more bang for your buck. So you get that kind of demographic as well. The guys that show up at the racetrack and then you race your two hours and you, you go home. And so I don't know. I think everybody when they first get a dirt bike, you grow up riding trails. The first thing you do is you go hit the trails, you go ride the trails with your dad, go ride the trails with your buddies. Um, so I, I feel like at the core of it, that's where a lot of people first learn how to ride a dirt bike. And then you start going to the track and learning moto and learning to jump. And so I, I don't think there's a lot of differences of fan in the fan base between off-road and moto. Um, I think it's all a core group and I think it's all a core group that, that likes dirt bikes. And I think it's a, a big group that is all involved in this world, but I would say a lot more similarities than, than differences in there. But I just... My thing is going back to these these pro riders, man. They deserve the the same recognition. The fans are a lot of the same, and uh, but I, I think the riders have a ton of grit, and I think they deserve a lot more exposure and stuff than they get. But um, the off road dirt bike mag says the off road fan is a racer, and the moto fan, in general, is just a fan that buys t shirts. Yeah, I mean that's I. Uh, that's kind of what what I meant. I did. I just didn't want to like offend anybody or make anybody mad when when I said that like the off road guy is more of like the the core racer and the guy out there buying parts and the guy that has the dirt bike at home and um, 
is going in racing races. Like I mentioned, a local race with 900 riders versus a local motor race with 50. Um, there's just a, a, a big difference in, in that. And I think the, the moto fan is, is buying their Fox t-shirts and, um, making sure that their, their skinny jeans match their shoes perfectly. And the off-road guy is, is worrying about dirt bikes. And I think that's what we see on, on OTP. Like as far as the, the active engagement that we have, the people that engage with the show that listen to the show on a, on a basis. I mean, this is super niche, very niche part of a very niche sport of the people that are um, watching off-road or are listening to OTP because, like we mentioned, you had to have an entire segment to explain to the moto community who Caleb Russell is. Meanwhile, the guys that know all the guys on the A and B rows at every GNCC are, are tuning in to, to listen to race results on a weekly basis. So, I don't know, man. I kind of found my home in the off-road world and, and love the people, love love everything that, that goes on in there. So, uh, I'm very thankful and very happy to have this small port of uh of the race world with this thing that we've built at otp so i think that's a good place to wrap it up like i said uh you can definitely find this episode anywhere you can find your podcast and uh yeah we will see you at iron man this weekend i'll have a bunch of pink stickers i got regular stickers so if you see me at iron man stickers are completely free uh and then like i said i'll have some some hoodies and some sweatshirts and stuff with me this weekend and some t-shirts uh so yeah maybe maybe we'll give some stuff away but yeah, if you see me, come say, hey, I got some stickers for you. We'll see you this weekend, and we'll see you next week on OTP. Thanks, everybody, for listening. As always, be a friend. Tell a friend. See you.